Good evening. I'd like to call this uh, meeting of the Lakeville Planning Board to order. It is Thursday, January 12th at 7 p.m. We're meeting at the Lakeville Police Station meeting room. Uh, and this meeting is being filmed by Lake Cam. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to uh, go into our first agenda item, which is a uh, discussion on the housing production plan. Uh, we have a presentation by Taylor Perez from SERPED. Thank you. Um, so less of a presentation, like definitely more of a discussion. Um, I know this is in your packet, so you folks can look at it there as well. But Mark and I have been talking over the past couple of weeks, trying to kind of figure out what we want to do in the plan. Um, and so the process right now where we're at is we have goals and strategies that are two required sections within the housing production plan. And so given the feedback that we received from the survey that we reviewed at the last meeting um, and just local knowledge, some GIS work, et cetera, this is kind of where we're at. Um, and so we could just walk through them and really primarily what I'd like to get out of this conversation tonight with you folks is just like a feeler on where we're at if these goals feel appropriate given Lakeville's kind of situation right now and where, you know, the residents wish to see. And then again, that the strategies are adequately accomplishing the goals. Um, again, just making sure that everything here is reflective and um, accurate to what we'd like to see kind of going on here. So. We'll start with the goals and then once we feel good about that, we'll move into the strategies. Um, we like to keep it to usually like four to six goals. I think anything more feels a little onerous. Anything less feels like it's not you know, necessarily sufficient for what we're trying to do. So the four goals that we have here are conduct public outreach to determine local housing needs, preferences, and to educate the community on housing options. The second goal is to create housing options and to modify existing units to support older adults who wish to age in place or to downsize. The third goal is implement key zoning amendments to create new affordable housing options and to ensure compliance with Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 40A, Section 3A, otherwise known as the MBTA Communities. Uh, and the fourth goal is to continue to produce SHI eligible units to achieve the Commonwealth's required amount and to support communities in need. Uh, just to note, fourth goal kind of appears production plans, just a very, very standard catch all of like do the thing to get to 10% as required by the Commonwealth and as this housing production plan is set out to do. Um, so we'll pause here and then just kind of acknowledge, does this feel appropriate? Do we agree with the, you know, these four goals that we've set out to do? Um, and if we do or don't, again, I'm happy to hear feedback so that I can tailor this accordingly. Mr. Chair, I have one question. <clears throat> on, Go right ahead. Uh, on goal B, will you talk about creating housing options and modifying units for older adults. Mm -hmm. What's the percentage of adults in Lakeville that are considered senior citizens? Um, I, we'd have to look at the, um, the census, census data. The latest census data for many things, including population, has just been released. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know off the top of my head what that number okay. is. We don't have any idea of what I, I couldn't give you the percentage, but I do know that the median age, so I was reviewing your previous housing production plan again, just to ensure that like we were keeping on track with what we had set out to do prior. And I know that in that one, which was written in 2018 or so, the median age had already increased to like 40 something, which is high. Um, and, you know, most of our communities <coughs> in the Southeast are aging in general anyways. So this is typically something that we see and address. Um, and on the survey, it was noted too that some folks didn't feel that there were enough adequate housing options for older adults. So what we try and provide for in terms of options, especially is um, modifications to existing housing. Uh, well, and, and that's the reason I'm asking the question. I know it came back in the survey and everything, mm -hmm. but I, what degree of emphasis should mm -hmm. we be placing sure. on that? Sure. That has to have some type of parameter versus uh, related to the population. Right. So that's why I'm asking that. Right. That makes sense. I will definitely get that number. Um, like Mark said, I know the 2020 census is, <laughs> has been rolling out for several years now, um, which has uh, been, been interesting for all of us who, who need the data. <laughs> but um, we can reference probably the 2021 ACS would be the most up to date. Um, and we will do that in the plan. But okay. again, just to give kind of a context in Mansfield, for example, who had a similar median age, their population of older adults, anyone over 65 was like 20 something percent. And it had doubled essentially from 9% in the past 20 years. Okay. So, so pretty. Yes, what's up? Jeff, what do you got? 
Can you define for me vulnerable communities? Sure, sure. So again, it could be anyone who is in danger or danger may be the strong word, but um, in a position where that they might not be able to keep the housing that they are in or um, you know, might be in a precarious housing situation in general. So when we talk about older adults, for example, we consider them a vulnerable community because a lot of the times, like we just said, the housing that they have might not necessarily reflect their needs as they age. So they might live in a house that's too large to maintain. Um, they might need you know, a bathroom on the first floor and then that might, like, might not be available in the current house that they have. So ensuring that those types of communities, so whether it's older adults, um, or you know, adults living on social security, or adults who have a fixed income, so retired folks, for example, who are not like working or having any other income, um, we consider them vulnerable communities. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, on goal D, mm -hmm. what I guess support communities in need. Mm -hmm. The term communities is more of a segment of Lakeville. Yes, it's not other communities. Right. Right. Uh, so, I guess, what does that mean? And I, I, well, that's related and then to the first part of D also, also is continue to producing uh, the subsidized housing eligible units. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that that's, uh, to me, that's written as a task of the town of Lakeville, whereas typically that's a task of the developer. Right. So, well, go ahead. You go first. I was going to say, it can be both. Right. So, um, through 40B applications and some other applications developers use, they can produce affordable units for the community, right? Um, but there are other ways that the community can create the own, their own units. Mm -hmm. um, they can, you know, uh, through a housing authority, through a home program. Local initiative program. Um, you know, uh, there are other uh, local LIP program mm -hmm. um, with or without other developers involved. So, so there are other programs that the community can be proactive about creating units. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say that it's anything so. really beyond that. Um, again, this is like a very, like, catch-all blanket statement that every housing production plan receives for anyone who is even over 10 percent like in mansfield we had the same goal to maintain the 10 percent um it's just a, a broad statement to say like in some way shape or form can pursue increasing your your number of shi units um it, it doesn't necessarily say which way i think that's kind of for us to decide together if we want to pursue something like through the local initiative program where you have a parcel that might be eligible for housing you put out an rfp or again if it's just like proactively working with 40b developers etc cetera, etc cetera, um, it could really come in a number and a variety of ways that you folks feel is most appropriate but just given that lakeville is under 10 percent and it just the mandates required by the state it, it kind of has to be said um, in some way shape or form but again i think there's a lot of room for us to determine what the most appropriate mechanism to do that is and the timeline um, you know, effectively for the next five years, all you would have to do is produce your 1% to get your two years of safe harbor. Um, so, Mr. Chair, <clears throat> if I may. So I think, I think when we talk about 40B, um, I think that's probably not something that we should focus on. I think we should try to find something that works for Lakeville. Lakeville residents are not against affordable housing. Mm -hmm. They're against dense, housing mm -hmm. and that's um what you know th you think of with the 40b and then it, it blows apart your zoning sure. sure you know existing zoning laws mm -hmm. so i think something that works for lakeville you know might not be something that is such of a blanket mm -hmm. term that works for other mm -hmm. towns and cities um because any any of the communities in massachusetts that have reached that 10 percent, they do not reflect um a rural community sure. like Lakeville. Sure. So maybe we can tweak this D to be something, you know, not to achieve the Commonwealth's required amount. Um, maybe we can tweak it some in a, in a way that works for Lakeville where it's providing housing units, not through 40B, not on a developer's behalf, 
but um, maybe something more along the lines of inclusive zoning, which I think is something for us to possibly consider because that would, inclusive zoning means we would create the zoning uh -huh. that would then say every time a subdivision is built, uh -huh. they have to provide a certain number of units within sure. that subdivision, uh -huh. but it's still within our zoning uh -huh. requirements. So I think something that works for Lakeville may, may be a little bit more unique than a blanket statement. Sure. Um, the only thing I can think of is the, it's not necessarily an issue, but it's, it is difficult to write a housing production plan without in some way, shape or form addressing 40B, you know, as the enabling legislation and the fact that this will go to DHGD for review before it can be formally like adopted. Um, so, I don't know that it can necessarily be removed, but again, we can. It can be one. Of well, can we tweak it though? Is many. there maybe some like language that we can? Sure, sure. Know. We can definitely do our best to kind of get to that um, that consensus. Yeah, and I, I I think Michelle makes a good point. That generally, if we have four goals up there, fifty percent of them are affordable housing mm -hmm. driven, and I don't think that's. <clears throat> As Michelle said, and I guess I'd like everybody else's input, that that shouldn't be Lakeville's only goal. Agree. Pete? I agree. Yeah. I agree. Jack? No, I, I agree. Yeah, but I don't read this that way. But that's okay. Well, I just look at two of the goals. <clears throat> two out of the four goals are to create either zoning or <coughs> to drive the affordable housing. So, just if I may, for goal C2 as well, this also is a jargon thing and I apologize that it might not be clear but when we discuss like affordable housing there's the referral to like both subsidized so the SHI uh, eligible housing and then also the kind of like naturally occurring market rate housing um, and so we have been we as in Serpent have been definitely doing our best to focus not just on like let's create subsidized housing alone but also that kind of missing middle affordable market rate housing um, so when we actually get into the strategy we, and we talk about the key zoning amendments again and that's open for discussion some of those include not necessarily like subsidized affordable housing options but smaller smaller lot sizes necessarily or you know lesser restrictions on adus i mean just to say to you guys have a very progressive adu bylaws are good for you folks but um there are a, a myriad of different ways and I, i'm totally on board with we should focus on all at once and not just one thing Martin, I can ask a question. You know, once again, back to my first question mm -hmm. about uh, vulnerable communities, we mm -hmm. talked about affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Aside from the affordable housing, mm -hmm. does that provide us another avenue there, this uh, vulnerable, uh, vulnerable communities? Is another, that something different? Another avenue towards... Well, you know, we talked about, we seem to be focusing on, yeah, we seem to be focusing on affordable housing. Right. Is vulnerable, vulnerable, uh, communities a uh, different it can be together. it can be um, I mean so affordable housing in terms of again the subsidized affordable housing is that income restricted and honestly given the rising median incomes the the target population is is very much like moderate income folks in when we're doing SHI eligible housing but it that can open the door for not just like an income focused thing but an age restricted housing avenue or a, you know if you folks feel that there are a lot of people with families who you know wish to upsize downsize if they're older or folks with kids who are getting out of college and want to live in Lakeville with their family um, it, it can it can be all sorts of individuals that we can target um, again it just depends on what you folks feel is appropriate mm -hmm. but um, just given the nature and the scope of the housing production plan there are kind of some minimum boxes we have to check um, but we can always be as expansive as we like because it is a we look at it more as a housing plan as a whole, not just the HPP under the statute. So something you had said, I guess, intrigues me mm -hmm. that, and I, I questioned it a little bit, the, the, the possibility you had said to create, or under C, the zoning to create affordable, not by uh, state standards, mm -hmm. but just Mm -hmm. less expensive housing sure. by making zoning to maybe allow smaller lots. I know uh, Mark had drafted up uh, an open space development mm -hmm. plan yep. uh, 
that I think we'll, we'll probably revisit in some time in the future. Mm -hmm. But uh, is, is that what we're talking about yeah. to do that? Yep, things like that. Things, um, I mean, I know in your master plan of TDR, Transfer Development Rights Bylaw was encouraged as well. Um, it could be, like you said, an inclusionary. Um, it could just be smaller lot sizes to encourage smaller home sizes and just lower costs. But again, I mean, I also acknowledge that in this type of market, there's a lot of um, innate volatility. Um, but those are the types of things, yes, that yeah, we are talking it's about. It's really not that controllable. Right. It's the free market will right. kind of find its own level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and even, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, even with the, uh, with the 40B, when you're, when you have a small per percentage that have to be um, a certain low rate compared to the other units, uh, in a sense, it's going to drive those other units' cost or price up higher. So you're really, even though you're trying to c uh, create some more affordable units, you're actually driving the price up at the same time by, by, by m making the developer um, sell those at a lower cost as well. So at least in terms of 40B, there's a subsidizing agency that will subsidize the unit. So that could be mass housing, that could be DHCD, that could be any other number of agencies. Um, and so really the, from my understanding, the only kind of uh, additional task that falls on behalf of the developer is just uh, ensuring that a lottery occurs and that there's an affirmative fair market um, plan that it takes place and whatnot. But there is to some extent someone who does subsidize that unit who might not usually is not the developer they subsidize um, that unit but the other units uh are quote unquote market value price and i think right. that's where the concern is that market value seems to be escalating all right. those non 40b right uh, mm -hmm. residents sure uh, as i read c mm -hmm. i i don't interpret new affordable housing as being necessarily all encompassing a 40a 40b 40r whatever you sure. want to yeah. call it but sure more affordable to what the medium income mm -hmm. of the residents of Lakeville can afford. Right. Right. And then as, as a component of that, we also have to be in, in compliance with uh, the Commonwealth's requirements for 40B, 40A. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so I don't read that as just being 40B, 40, yeah, uh, 40A. Uh, I agree that it's not just that. Uh, I guess when somebody else reads this, I feel like would it be wise for the open space bylaw to be referenced within that? We say, absolutely can. I, I, I think that having something like that in there to make people realize it's not a 40B sure. uh, pull, it's, sure. uh, it's straight up another uh, free market option. Right. It was actually, it that. was in your previous housing production plan, so I'm happy to include that yeah. as a carryover as well. Oh, as was the um, inclusionary zoning mm -hmm. that was also mentioned mm -hmm. there. I got a question, Chair <coughs> um, So, in the whole Commonwealth, how many towns uh, have reached there? Um, any? There oh, yeah, um, definitely. I couldn't give you a number no. off the top of my head, but no. <laughs> it's not a lot. At least, in, yeah, it really depends on the community. Uh, at least in our region, I know Plainville is at 16%, Mansfield is at 10%, uh, Middleborough is at, it will be at 10 and change soon once a permit goes through. Um, Several communities with such a new development right now, they're only sitting at seven percent. They're at eight point something right now, and they have two like large units coming in right. um, through the pipeline. Right. So I know Leanne Bradley has already kind of been in communication with DHD about that, but they likely will approach ten percent, if not be over soon. Uh, Marion is at eight percent or so, um, but then there are communities. I mean, late. Considering Lakeville's rural character and the fact that like there is a limited here, the fact that you folks are at six and a half percent, I personally do find impressive because you'll see places like Rochester, which have 0.4. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, I don't want to go without acknowledging. Um, but there, there are for sure places who have exceeded the 10%. Um, again, I couldn't give you the number off the top of my head, but those are kind of the local examples that I can think of. John, what do you got? Uh, isn't Mark's concerns about zoning changes also reflected in uh, goal number three. So that's what we're referencing, yes. Right, right. It's just, I wanted to specifically call out what the zoning changes we may propose mm -hmm. for that would be to okay. clarify that it's just not only affordable housing. Okay. Mm -hmm. so. so given this conversation, do we want to kind of move into the strategies to discuss some of those deeper zoning changes? 
Uh, before we do, I just I guess I want to make sure that we don't want to go backwards to goals. Is there anything else that anybody thinks from a goals standpoint we should have up there? Uh, as Taylor said, we could have as many as maybe six goals. Feeling, feeling good? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm good with four. Four is, I think, achievable. Um, I'm sorry, what would you, I didn't hear you. That's more than plenty. Right, <laughs> right, all right, I think it's. Okay, uh, so on cool. strategies. Excellent. So um, some of these first ones, again, I think the one we'll probably spend the most time on is strategy three, um, but again, addressing our goal about uh, modifying existing units and creating housing options for older adults. The first strategy is to pursue partnerships and funding resources to provide direct assistance to preserve housing, again, for vulnerable communities, um, including senior residents. Um, below is just kind of a blurb about what that means, but essentially it's just direct preservation tactics such as uh, low interest or no interest home loans to make accessibility modifications, um, or if there was anyone in town who had an older home that had needed lead abatement or uh, any sort of emergency repair, et cetera. That's the kind of target, um, target audience of this strategy. And again, New Bedford has done something like this. There is funding from the Commonwealth uh, who distributes CDBG funding. Um, if you folks were feeling really ambitious, you could form a regional consortium to directly apply for it, but I think that would be kind of a lot. Um, but that's, that's the intent of this, this first one here. And then two, pursue partnerships leading to development that is affordable to those with low, moderate, and fixed incomes. This is that friendly friendly 40B, kind of 40B specific goal um, where it's work with developers to see a development outcome that you would like to see that's not something, as you referenced earlier, too dense or out of context with Lakeville. Um, I know Plainville has done things like that where they had, for example, the Oasis, which is right on a main road, but the town planner worked directly with the developer to, you know, uh, institute modifications to it, add screening, et cetera, et cetera, um, all sorts of ways to kind of negotiate. But this is that one like true 40B specific goal that we, again, kind of have to include just given the nature um, of what a housing production plan is. It's hard to, to write one and not talk about 40B um, in some way, shape or form. So this is addressing, addressing that. Um, and you address that by saying may assist, not net you have to assist in attracting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, um, and like Mark and I were saying, this is, this would kind of come through either the local initiative program. So essentially, like we said, it, they, you know, there's a parcel in town that folks are interested in seeing housing development. You put out an RFP. Um, it comes through as a comprehensive permit, et cetera. Um, there's a whole whole program through the Commonwealth that supports that type of development. But this is just the one of the seven um, that really explicitly addresses that. And then three is the key zoning amendments one. So ensuring compliance with section 3A. Um, again, I, I think we're, we're feeling the likelihood of that is already pretty good, but um, can't say for certain. And then again, creating new housing opportunities for some of those vulnerable communities we discussed, first time buyers who might be struggling to purchase a home um, if their family lives in Lakeville and they wanna live here too. Uh, older adults who might have a large house and wanna downsize. And those again, with some sort of moderate or fixed income. And so I've already made a note here to include, um, I made a note here to discuss with you folks, I, I figured this would be something that we'd want to spend a lot of time on, to add the open space um, design bylaw into here as an option. Um, and a lot of this was described in your previous housing production plan, just again, that there's a lot of low density, you know, there's low density single family zoning um, without kind of, uh, Addressing that sometimes it can lead to suburban sprawl. It can actually end up fracturing habitats, lead to more deforestation, um, and you know, without having some sort of density outlet, that might be the case. Again, not not saying it is necessarily, um, but that's kind of what we were discussing when we talked about something like an OSRD or a TDR bylaw, or just even having slightly denser zoning in a key area in town. Um, and then just to note on 3A again. You folks already have a 40R, good for you folks, um, because it's currently got a capacity for 353 future zone units, uh, at least considering the amendment that I have seen listed in July of 2018. 
And so under Section 3A, you folks are considered an adjacent small town, um, and therefore you have to zone for a district of no minimum size, which is great, uh, no, no location requirement, um, that will have capacity for at least 231 multifamily units by right. Um, again, we just have exploring the 40 hours compliance under that because they're tangentially related. Um, and, you know, again, that's kind of going to end up being its own separate thing, but we've just been addressing it in the housing production plan since again, we're just talking about housing broadly here and that's an ongoing thing. Um, and so I'll pause here to kind of go through the first three. Um, <clears throat> I have a question. If you go ahead. Um, so that, that section you just read, section 3A, um, it's, it's almost implying that the state's um, rail community, um, it may actually use our existing 40R. It could. And right. it could apply to both. Right. So... That we could use our existing 40R to comply with Section 3. To right. Comply. So, not, not the existing buildings. Right. So, just to kind of pause too on Section 3A, so there's no need, at least under the current guidelines and the way that the legislation is written, to prove that capacity, or, or I should say, prove that units are being built on the ground. It's very much a question of just your zoning capacity. Um, so, even though the 40R has capacity for 353 units there, and there might be less actually developed. Given the way the zoning is kind of being formulated, that might not necessarily, that doesn't matter. Um, you don't have to go to the Commonwealth and furnish like permits or something to be like, we built 353 units. It's only the question of, can your zoning allow for up to that? Um, and there is kind of a couple different places in the guidelines where they state that they understand that there's all sorts of like market limitations and whatnot that could prevent development ever really truly reaching that requirement that they're establishing. But again, you folks look well positioned and I'm only saying look because we won't know until we run a compliance model to ensure that your 40R could be compliant under, under 3A. Again, given that you have those units um, but it, 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 we just we have to kind of look into it and confirm it. But yes, in short, your 40R could potentially be the, the pathway to comply and has been in many communities, I think. Hmm. Good news, right? <laughs> now, if I may just add one more thing. I know Middleborough actually, um, they, they actually have denied. Yes. Um, the state requirement and yes. i think one of the comments i read um was that you know if enough towns push back perhaps the state would um resend the mandate um so i think this is something interesting to consider but i don't think we should get comfortable and um and, and think oh it it'll go away because we also know that if it's zoned by right it'll come I it'll mean, absolutely, your, it'll actually Your 40R fast. has been in place since 2009 by right. So what has come hopefully has already come. Um, it's, again, I think you folks are well positioned and it would be advantageous to see if you comply just to kind of do it and get it done with. Because if you folks are in a position where you had no existing zoning that could potentially comply, I think that might be a bit different of a situation, but given that the 40R is already here, has been in place for a long time, you don't necessarily, you might not need to make amendments. I, I, I can't say for certain. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of like free money floating around just to be like, give it a try, see what's going on. Um, uh, and Mark and I have kind of discussed this at length already, but it would be again, advantageous to at least pursue confirming that that 40R does or does not comply before you kind of proceed from so, there. so to be clear though the 40r that exists you're talking about the language of the zoning mm -hmm. but in order to then if it's applicable we need to overlay it somewhere else no yeah no. yes yes because they built out the existing 40r district with units and however not i believe at the density i don't know what the total number of units is but i don't believe they're at the 
353 I, number? I don't believe that you would need to move it to accommodate new development. Um, again, this is kind of where the idea of like, just showing your zoning has the capacity for that development, but not necessarily like talking about the development on the ground. It's very much like uh, when you run the compliance model, like ignorant of that, it might look and say like, uh, this is not developable because there's wetlands or something like that. But um, again, from my understanding, I don't know that there would need to be like a relocation or something like that. That my my initial understanding is of that that you could just. So if we were to pursue the possibility of determining that that works, mm -hmm. I mean, is that so something? Who does that? Who, who determines? So th this is really, we're moving into the next item on the agenda, um, which is a, a discussion of the MBTA community program, um, assistance that we've re received from Mass Housing Partnership mm -hmm. to work with SERPID on a compliance model and um, achieving the goals of, of uh, Chapter 3A requirements here. So. Um, but that's that's kind of like a whole nother discussion. Mm -hmm. I, I think we ought to try and get through this yep. housing sure. production plan, and then we can get back into a more detailed discussion about that one item. Sure. About that one item. That's good. So, given that aside, um, yeah, we're happy to discuss that after this. Uh, are there any other kind of key zoning? you know, uh, changes or items that we wish to listen here. Again, I have the OSRD listed. The only other thing I personally listed here was that, again, you guys have a very progressive accessory apartment bylaw, so good for you folks. It's by right in the residential zone. The size is appropriate. I think the only thing I read, and it, it wasn't like explicitly called out as a bulleted point for a requirement, but it said for family members. Um, and in some places, some folks remove the family member only requirement. Um, that, that could be, in my opinion, the only thing that you could uh, allow. But again, kudos to you folks, your accessory apartment bylaws is very, is very good. So if opinion. you could scroll the screen so we could look back at strategy sure. one and two. Of course. I guess I have some questions about those. Sure. Uh, on strategy one, mm -hmm. uh, partnership funding to provide assistance mm -hmm. for, you know, emergency repairs, ADA improvements, roofing side. So, and this is a high priority and this is direct action. So are we a lender? I guess, what is sure. the action? What, sure. What's going on? Sure. There? I have, I can definitely clarify that too within the writing, but, um, essentially it could be through a number of ways. Again, the way I've seen it done is sometimes uh, communities will form like a regional consortium and Lakeville doesn't necessarily have to be the, the person at the helm, um, but folks will apply for, you know, form a consortium who then work to apply for funding as a group, who then disseminate funding. It could be through a board. Um, and I, we, the priorities can absolutely change. Um, they're all just drafted in this form right now. And the only reason it's listed as direct is because it's very directly addressing that goal B of helping preserve housing for older adults and anyone who might be aging. Um, but I'm happy to be more specific about who that could be. Um, because again, I, there's, well, I, there's kind of a, yeah. I mean, I think if, if we're really talking about like a housing rehab program mm -hmm. using 40 B dollars, I mean, the town, can apply for that and start its own program. Mm -hmm. The problem with Lakeville is we probably rank fairly low mm -hmm. on a um, uh, needs assessment. Like so DHCD does, uh, if you apply for CDBG funds as a, as a um, uh, individual, I don't know what it's called, non-entitlement community or um, <clears throat> they have a need score, and mm -hmm. given Lakeville's um, relatively high median, in, you know, income sure. level, um, we're not going to um, uh, score very well um, sure. unless we can show that there's a very large segment of the mm -hmm. population that is 
underrepresented that really cannot deal with their housing. So, right. I mean, so I, 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 I I've started those programs <coughs> in several places. So, so I think that said, that that's I think an important piece of information to us to maybe say that shouldn't be high priority if we're a low priority community. Um, and I, I, again, I'm, I look at that as we have to create some sort of a bureaucracy in town to manage that or to, Taylor, to what you said, you know, mm. so, somebody else has to take this initiative right. to do that. And I just, mm. I guess that scares me to mm -hmm. make that number one strategy. Sure, is, sure. I'd like to walk that back a little bit. It's nice that it's in there if it's a goal, but I don't think that it should be. We can absolutely do that. And I should um, address to that. I think the order right here now is not necessarily reflective of, um, the only thing that would be reflective would be the priority, but we can absolutely scale that down. Would we, would we feel more comfortable going medium or low? Well, I, I don't want to make the entire decision for the board, but what do you think, Peter? So, <clears throat> question, so how does the Board of Health manage their money <clears throat> with people with um, failed septic systems and whatnot, and 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 who takes it after they after they say, okay, you know, this person clearly needs financial help, but then who takes it from there for the years while they pay it back, or whatever? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure how they manage that program. I right. mean, that's a specific to septic repair in almost every community I've worked in. We've had sewer in almost. 100% of the community, so we didn't, I've never been in a town that had a septic repair program. Right. Um, the CDBG funding could be, if we had a CDBG program, could be used for septic repair if necessary for a home. CPAs um, I've also seen used for smaller right. modifications in homes and whatnot. Right, but we'd have to, you know, again, submit CBG application generally those um, you know and hire staff with the administrative to money to right. run it right. um, you know that's what I did when I was in Salisbury which was another small community but had a very very high need score um, and because of like uh, it, it does it follow like w when you have like say because um, I'm looking at this and I'm saying it asbestos abatement and lead paint mm. Right. Not so much. Yeah. We can we can remove. You that go to Brockton, yeah. where you have sure. a six family sure. and potentially twenty four people living in there sure. uh, quite legally, and it and it's like a lot of lead sure. paint and a lot of asbestos. Uh, yeah. So that's mm -hmm. what, that's what puts yeah. us mm -hmm. so low in mm -hmm. the uh, right. needs. Okay. But but things like a city like Brockton, okay, so Brockton, New Bedford, yeah, they're entitlement communities. So right. uh, so okay. when I managed Brockton's money, it was directly from HUD. Mm -hmm. You got gotcha. So right. I set up a program for them doing that, and uh, right. you know, New Bedford is in a similar and position. New Bedford's the same way. Yeah, then there are many entitlement communities whose mm -hmm. funds come from the state pass through the state right. but they are and I think that might be what Taunton is so those are yeah. the smaller cities uh, Newburyport Taunton you know the, the, the much smaller cities so, uh, with that, that have needs and yeah. then um, um, and then the other communities can apply on an annual basis for mm -hmm. well, it's almost that as a in the strategy we need to separate uh, housing for vulnerable communities and mm -hmm. senior citizens, because I would have I would be hard pressed to change the priority if we change leave senior citizen residents there, because we have that as a, a very specific goal uh, in goal B, uh, and, and that's just my thought. I, I would hate if we're really talking about senior citizens being twenty percent. Okay, uh, I I would be hard pressed to to remove that from high as long as senior residents remain as part of that particular strategy. So if I may, maybe what we do then is we scale back um, this strategy to be less of more like Lakeville initiates a new program or does something like that to maybe more like you folks can, we can gather some resources and like create a, 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 a web page or something if it's on your town, mm -hmm. if, if something like that doesn't already exist. Um, no, we do. No. Let me just throw out and it, it, just me thinking and spitballing here. Uh, Lakeville recently adopted uh, the Community Preservation Act. Yes, we have a 
Community Preservation Committee. Mm -hmm. And one component of that, which we actually don't have anybody appointed to that committee yet, is for housing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I look at this, and I, the first thing I went to was the ADA approvals. And let's just say there's an elderly person mm -hmm. that a husband and wife and one gets into a health condition where they need a, a ramp built mm -hmm. and they can't afford it. Mm -hmm. Is that something that we could, and, and again, I don't want to sit here, I'm not even on the committee to spend that housing money sure. from CPC, but is that maybe an avenue that we can make this work without creating a, a giant bureaucracy within town to say that, right. you know, maybe through that avenue funding could be driven towards an emergency repair for somebody that needed, you know, a senior that needed right. some sort of assistance like that. Is it one of the challenges trying to find people that have some background in this area to champion this cause? Right. So that's actually when we get further down, that is something um, that is addressed is potentially getting like a part time staff member again. These we will give like an implementation strategy, a timeline. So something like one would probably have a, a long timeline of, you know, we're, we're looking at the, the through the five year lifespan of the HPP. Um, if we were again going at this kind of level. Um, so when we kind of get there, even acquiring a part-time staff member will be something that to champion some of these efforts would be a longer term okay. goal. Um, and, but and, and having that strategy in there doesn't necessarily, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good strategy to have. I mean, there may be openings in various state programs. There may be new mm -hmm. state programs that might be, let's say, a lead paint abatement, like similar to the sure. sewer that sure. you don't have to run through CBG, uh, similar mm -hmm. to the septic. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, having something, and just because we have a high need score doesn't mean that as, as, um, as we work through some other things that we're currently working on mm -hmm. a year or two from now that maybe we don't put a CBG application together to do because it may become more apparent as, um, as, as other things are accomplished in this community that, well, okay, that is a, a significant need and, and we can mm -hmm. show to the state mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, and, and submit an application in the future. So I, I wouldn't necessarily want to pull that out. It, sure. it would may not be a number one strategy as sure. far as a priority to work on. Um, but and that you bring up a good point too. Um, Lakeville doesn't necessarily need to, like we said, kind of institute some level of bureaucracy. That's not necessary. Um, it could very much just be through something like a partnership where you get in touch with someone at like Mass Housing, for example, who also kind of does loan programs and whatnot for vulnerable communities. And given, you know, once you have a better kind of understanding of the need, um, you could reach out and say, hey, like, could you help us understand our options here, et cetera. So this is really insightful conversation because I think it very clearly helps me understand that like we can partition something like strategy one out and more clearly delineate the kind of the most involved pathway, the kind of middle ground pathway, which could, so the most involved again being like Lakeville champions a new consortium or does something really uh, involved or Lakeville pursues partnerships with programs like mass housing and, um, you know, pursues funding through the Commonwealth's uh, CDBG program that they have. Uh, and then the kind of like lowest, uh, not, I shouldn't say lowest priority, but like, you know, the lowest intensity pathway is Lakeville gathers information and um, publishes, you know, publicly resources that folks in town who may be interested in pursuing a, or, or need assistance in, you know, having an ADA modification or something like that. Here's the kind of hub where you can go and look and see what your options are. Um, so, does that does that make sense? Would that kind of better take the strategy and make it something that's like yeah, reasonable yep. and more actionable? Yes. Yep. Okay. And do we, I, given this again too, would we want to bump this maybe to maybe not low but medium because of the kind of intensity of it? Like well, it, you know, again to what Nora said, it, it, some of that cantilevers on the, the percentage of uh, the elderly folks in town are the, sure. the, the age required, mm -hmm. uh, and if that is high maybe we 
do keep it there, but I think maybe it just comes down on the list to, to place Right, it's not the first three. thing you read. I Totally. Uh, but number two, I mean, I, I'm looking at two and three myself, and I'm, I'm speaking to the board right now. Mm -hmm. um, should the priority on those be flipped? I, I think that number three, the yes. zoning and those items, that's a proactive thing that we can take on that cr possibly creates uh to me that would be fr friendly rural character homes uh that would be a, a market value affordable not subsidized mm -hmm. so i think to me that's a high priority for us okay number three yeah sure and is number two maybe not a high priority but a medium i think that or and, and again i mean is that no, it's, it's really not pushing the 40 B's as much as mm -hmm. it is trying to create a partnership. I, it's not talking about zoning, so I guess I'm a little bit confused as to how you create friendly 40 B's. Maybe you could speak to that, Mark. So you can create friendly 40 B's a couple different ways. One is um, a developer comes to the town and says, we're interested in a particular parcel. Um, we think like in our case, we can put 200 units there. We could probably put more, but we'd like to put the 200 units. But we're willing to work on the site design. We want to talk to you about what kind of issues. Uh, there's a neighborhood on one side, perhaps, or there's something else. Prior to them really getting into um, uh, a lot of engineering on their own, um, and spending a lot of money. So it's a lot of discussion up front. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, um, you know, some communities will say, yeah, we know we, you have to do some three bedrooms, but we'd like you to do kind of toward the minimum because it's by the highway. So we feel that <coughs> this would be a great community to look. So in Foxborough, we did that. There was a 40B we put in, it was the last parcel in a, uh, office slash industrial park um, right by the highway and we did that exact same thing they um, moved it away from the neighborhood across one street they put in a berm with plantings um, they did a minimum of um, of uh, three bedroom units it was like one per building uh, most one in two but it was a direct access like right to 95 and 495 was one exit away. I mean, it was uh, a really good location for it, so. Right. So that's one way. Another way is the town has property mm. put out in RFP for developments, communities, you set the parameters and you acknowledge the fact that permitting will go through a 40B process, but mm. because you own the property, you can set what the limits are. You can go, yeah, we could allow 40 be 200 units and you could build 200 units because the land could support it but we really only want 150. Mm -hmm. you know you, you right. can do stuff like that right so so again to, to the board members is that a high priority or how, how do you want to address item two i think two is more of a meeting priority okay i agree with the switch between two and three and yeah, um, that's fine now, my comment is this quote-unquote friendly 40Bs. I've always heard 40R referred to as friendly 40B. So when I hear it written as friendly 40B, I was thinking, oh, it's a 40R. But then what Mark described is it's a 40B. It's just a more amenable, amenable right. or version of a 40B. Right. So uh, I've heard friendly 40R as well. Um, some, some towns I've even seen in situations where it's a similar process to what Mark described with 40B, where a developer will come to a town and with a parcel in mind and say, we would like to put a development here under chapter 40R um, and essentially provides a draft of a 40R overlay that will then enable that development to occur. So there are things like that, but they are, they are different. Um, what Mark described is kind of what we're intentionally trying to do here is either a developer is, uh, you know, amicable and willing to work with the town or the town pursues a developer and sets the parameters upon which the development occurs. Um, Plainville has done that, as we were talking about earlier, which is how they have gotten to 16% um, 
in, in such kind of a, you know, a, a town with constraints just as, you know, Layfield has, uh, maybe not as many. Um, but for example, the Oasis, I know when I was talking with Chris Yarworth, who's their town planner, um, you know, he was going on and on, I, and he has an engineering background, so I do think that helps. Um, but he talked a lot about how he worked with the developer to, like he said, on the site design, on, he's like, I don't, <laughs> you know, not necessarily a negotiation for him on units, he was more concerned about roadway appearance and things of that nature, but there are developers out there who are kind of willing to work within that scope. Um, but it does depend. It's, it's more so being proactive about it so that you can see a better development outcome um, than otherwise if you had not been proactive. And again, on the priority, uh, whatever you folks feel, I'm happy to switch it to. No, no concerns there. Does it make any sense to add 440 R's to that? Sure, we can add that if, if, I mean, I know you folks have a 40R in existence already. If someone else wanted to implement another sub-district of the 40R elsewhere in town, you could, you could, I imagine you could do that. Anybody else amenable to that? I think the 40Rs are beneficial. Think, what's that? I think it's more beneficial yeah. for the town, yeah. the 40Rs. Yeah, I would say change the priority to medium on that and add 40Rs as well. Gotcha. Can do. So I have a question for number three. Mm -hmm. So assisted living facilities, are those units considered year-round housing units that are counted as, as housing units in the community? That's a great question. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know either. I, I, I couldn't, in terms of year-round housing units, the only thing I understand DHED removes is seasonal, and I don't think there would be anything that would constitute those to be seasonal. <laughs> right. um, so I imagine they would be counted. Um, I can't exactly say how, because um, they're they're under like kind of the boarding group housing use code style. Well, um, they, they, the ones I've seen are still an apartment. You sure. Still have an yeah. apartment I mean, if it's like separate units and, and whatnot, I can't imagine that they yeah, wouldn't be counted. It's not like a nursing home, which is right. different. Um, you know, uh, assisted living I've seen are so you full on adding assisted living to yeah, as as, no, uh, as a goal, senior housing slash assisted living bylaw sure. that would allow Excellent. the development of those at a at a higher density mm -hmm. within an affordable well component. Received. I think that would be yeah. The assisted living would certainly be well received. I think mm -hmm. by the town. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Happy to add that as well. I. I can't think off the top of my head which um, what town it is, but I know there is a town. It might it might be Sudbury. I'm not sure, but I know we have one um, that we reference frequently who has kind of like an assisted living. Uh, right, and generally they, you know, oh. there's a common dining area right. they can go to, and as right. they, right. Um, but they can also get right. meals brought to their rooms once they kind of get to. Mm -hmm. uh, need a higher level of care, sure. you know, so it's like a, a menu kind of, right. you know, check off what you need. So, talk, to, I guess, uh, what is the feeling then uh, on s things like design guidelines? Um, I, I kind of toyed around the idea of including something like that in here with my colleague Robert, who's kind of the other half of the housing um, group in Serped, and we just weren't sure if it was necessary but again if we're kind of getting into things like that where you have more visual preferences that could be incorporated into that well, like are we oh well, in our so we adopted a, a, a revised a new site plan review bylaw uh -huh. so um, it applies to commercial and multifamily developments right. Right. and within that there is it's not an extensive workbook sure. on design guidelines, sure. but it does give the planning board, it kind of outlines some basic parameters, mm -hmm. and then it gives the planning board in, in its language a lot of authority to modify and request, mm -hmm. make re request changes to, um, to design. And do we feel, given that amendment, that that is sufficient because if that's the case we, we do not have to include any other additional language on it do you think it i mean i think at, at this point um, it's 
since we just passed it last <laughs> spring. <laughs> you know, it's it's like eight months old. Sure. I mean, I think we should kind of kind of. You know, I mean, you can add that, you know, at some point in the future, maybe it might be desirable to enhance that, and okay. turn it into more of a mm -hmm. design booklet. But I would, I would put that part of it as like super low priority. Right. Because, low, long. Yeah, low, long, long term. Because line. you have something now, let's see how you guys implement it and how well it works with people. You know, understand where there are some weaknesses where mm -hmm. it's we need to adjust some language mm -hmm. and then where we may want to um, enhance it as as time goes on so um that sounds good the reason i ask is because when we're talking about some of um any of these potential zoning amendments one of the biggest ways to um hide density or kind of um you know incorporate it better is through things like design guidelines. So um, I think what you offered as like, we maybe included in there as like, let's think about this <laughs> at some point after we've kind of ran through this new process, um, but maybe still acknowledging it is, uh, is relevant to this. Do folks agree? Yes. Yep. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else on one, two, or three? Uh, no. Good. Mm -hmm. Good. Wonderful. All right. Four, five, six, and seven. Um, let me extend this down a little bit. So this is what we talked about. Pursue professional support to assist in conducting community outreach to better determine local needs and housing preferences. We've already kind of started to do something like that here with this housing production plan by doing an initial community survey. Um, which I think had like 250 responses or so. Great feedback. 250? That's it? I know. <laughs> it feels low given, um, given the kind of- very low. It, what's odd is I was very happy with it because when we do surveys, um, you often get a very small subset of the population, um, but that was high for a housing survey that we've seen here. And even given Lakeville's low population, it was very high given the proportions we've seen in other towns. So, um, little chair at least for that I was happy uh, with it but again this is why I think we kind of still include that like there's much more to be done to determine um, what the community is thinking and what they per like want what they need um, I think is kind of the most important thing we have kind of gauged their housing preferences a little bit um, but that could be through a myriad of different ways um, the most kind of notable one is Organizations like CHAPA, the Citizens Housing and Planning Association have um, municipal engagement initiatives and then a uh, MEI light program. So there's two separate of the same kind of program that are aimed at either helping create um, new groups in town that represent housing interests in town or help, for example, if you were trying to get a zoning bylaw to pass a town meeting, they can help kind of um, assist with getting the the education, the word out there about what is going on. So there's organizations like that. Um, there's is, even just, go is ahead. Is there anyone doing, any town doing an out of the box type of outreach or communication with its uh, residents? <coughs> I mean, we just never seem to do enough. <laughs> I mean, and I right. don't have 250 right. results. You think it's good. I don't think and it's I'm bad. Right. <laughs> so, I but two hundred again, two hundred fifty people of, are going to guide us in decisions we're making about a, the town. I understand. You know what, what else can we be doing as an outreach? And to me, that's what's important here. And I right. agree, it's probably a medium uh, when you consider the other things that need to be high. But somehow, we 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 need to get an outreach going. Sure. Our our, our hometown website is kind of static sure uh not really anything other than normal business gets posted their facebook sure. is the same way sure it's almost like we need a uh, me a social media outreach person and that's just not social media i guess maybe it's just a media outreach sure uh, somebody that's going to keep putting things out there uh for the residents to be able to tap into or read right. about or, or whatever right i can offer my perspective yes, um yes, go ahead 
Rusty's here. He yeah. does that. Say what? Rusty's <laughs> here. <laughs> um, that's not doing very well in his readership either. I can what offer my mean? opinion. I like it. I think it is. I get it every week. I think it is. Yeah, that's awesome. seems to disappear and, and honestly, from town hall. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, like, I'll echo Nora's. I think but i think it's not just me maybe this is even higher because mm -hmm. i know in speaking to residents about the C the housing component of the cpa mm -hmm. you know when when you say affordable housing people they're like no because they yep. think high crime they right. think you know it's going to sure. tax our right well, our, our, associating our fire department or 40 b are yes. exactly are. but then when you not say listen forward. don't you want affordable units for your seniors for your veterans mm -hmm. for your for your teachers, for, okay. for the people, you know, working in town. And they say, yes, we do. Yeah, yeah, oh. they're on board. So I think I think a lot of that does come from um, outreach and an educational campaign would benefit the town just, just to get people on board with some of these items in here. Sure. Because I think in order to get from, you know, some people on board with some of these items, I think the outreach has to come first, actually. So I would almost say, let's put it high. Sure. I mean, I, you know, I echo Michelle's comments. Uh, I mean, you know, when they were going to, when Stone, Stonebridge was going to expand the housing ordinance over here in the, country, in the little barren country club, the very first thing out of these people's mouth was low-income housing. We don't want any more of that stuff mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, like Norris says, you know, we got to in, somehow improve the communication to the residents. Mm -hmm. I mean, Many of the residents I know, even when I go up just to get my papers renewed, they have no idea who in the world, you know, the planning board is or mm -hmm. what's going on. Mm -hmm. Which you know, that's totally you know, the <laughs> bunny trail, but right. No, but it is. I mean, you're you're exactly right. People complain and they want all these things, but it's not. It's it's a few that are speaking, and it's the few that are governing everything. And then, as we've seen. Everybody else blows up when something becomes an issue. Well, when you see the population of, of Lakeville and only 917 or 71 people came to the town meeting. I mean, That's impressive. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was well, better. Uh, it was <laughs> <laughs> <That's pretty laughs> What's the population of Lakeville? 11,000. 12, 18,000. Yeah, 11, 5, yeah. 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 So. Yeah, something like change, 11, yeah. 6. Growing. Okay, so what are we doing on number four? Hi? Feeling high? I'd say hi, personally. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm, with that. I'm very pleased to hear um, the outreach uh, push as well because that's a lot of what I do at my job and we are dealing with a lot of the same issues of just like folks are not well outreach always helps aware. Us get the other ones done. yeah right. absolutely it's super important and um, it empowers your community to, to feel involved um, which mm -hmm. is again very necessary yeah. in any any community um, great so we'll flush that out. Uh, we'll spend, we'll bump this up too as well. So it's kind of one of the first things that you read. Um, I will at a later point reorganize these and let you folks know what the new order is and we can discuss from there, but great. Moving on to five. This is kind of what we discussed earlier. And again, medium priority, uh, helpful and will enable kind of all of the goals to be achieved in time. And it doesn't necessarily be, need to be CPA funding. It's just something that I've referenced here because again, I know you folks recently adopted and I have seen it done through CPA in the past, but it could just be a straight new staff member um, to hire a part-time housing staff member or even just contract with a consultant to assist in implementing the strategies that we've outlined here um, or beyond the kind of scope of what is in here, depending on what you folks would like to see. And so just to give an example, this is what the town of Wellfleet did. Um, Wellfleet does a lot of housing work through their CPA program, and I'm not necessarily saying that you folks need to reflect that kind of percentage of spending or anything like that, but one of the things that they have done through CPA um, is, is use some of that money to get a housing designated um, person to do work there for the year, um, and they assisted with developing a housing production plan for them. So that is one viable pathway. There are many. Um, Again, depending on if you want internal or external expertise, um, but we have just kind of listed this as something to consider. And again, this would be something like a longer term goal. I would say it's a low priority. Sure. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a while before we have, I mean, Michelle may correct me, but would you agree, Michelle? Yeah, I don't, I think before we need to, wrap, wrap we have to build some money up. Sure. We've got to, right, know, it is still get a lot of things in place. Right. 
So get the residents on board as well. Sure. Most of you people here know more about this than I do, but if we don't have someone that spearheads this, how do any of these goals get accomplished? Get to work, Jack. Just kidding. Get to work, Jack. Wealthy, uh, they spent uh, 4.6 million of, of the town's money, or is that CPA money? CPA. And then later, CPA money. Yeah. Yikes. They're, they're doing a lot of spending. That's what I was saying, too. You don't necessarily, this is over the course of a given number of time, too. Like, it's not like from And that's only in their housing bucket of CPA funds, right? Right. Right. So they have a pretty lucrative CPA fund. Right. So I mean, I think they have a 2%. Cert I can't remember if it's 2 or 3. Um, but again, uh, Wellfleet is a very affluent community. Sure. Um, and this is just a success story. It doesn't necessarily, again, need to reflect that you folks need to spend 47% no, no. of what... Right, because I know that CPA here is obviously going to be very focused on conservation, open space initiatives, historic preservation where appropriate, um, which is totally understandable. But it is an avenue um, that in time could be pursued. So if we want to bump this to low, and then again, it will be listed as a kind of longer term priority, that is that is completely fine with me. That sounds good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. And then these last two go in kind of um, tandem with one another and tie into that conversation we had about just like being, a, being proactive about having kind of municipal led housing development occur. Um, and we have to address this in the housing production plan through an action map or some sort of similar kind of thing, uh, which is, so six, investigating opportunities for adaptive reuse to redevelop underutilized municipally owned land and buildings. So that's just like inventorying what you have that the you know, you know, Lakeville owns, seeing if any of it could be reutilized, redeveloped. Um, and then again, seven, review the availability of town owned land and tax title properties. Um, tax tile, <laughs> but tax title properties to work in tandem with those goals. So they go hand in hand. Um, again, this is a very common set of two strategies that we list in every housing production plan because it's just the most kind of immediate thing a municipality could pursue, which is just looking at what they already have and what they can do with it. Um, they're both here listed as low because Mark and I have already had kind of an extensive conversation about that a lot of land here is um, under What's the, what's the right phrasing? Like just has a lot of different um, restrictions or things that would prevent development, whether it's the lack of infrastructure, the size of the parcel, the location, um, proximity to wetlands, et cetera, et cetera. So we are already kind of aware that this inventory might not be um, large enough to like necessarily produce anything, but it would still be of use to, to explore it. And we will kind of do that regardless because we need to. Straightforward. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. So, anything on four, five, six, and seven beyond what we discussed? Great. Um, one question. Sure. Underutilized municipal land and buildings, but not necessarily wanting to um, uh, purchase the town, purchase a building, and, and make it and, and bring it into their um, fold, and then use it for that. I mean mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily need to it doesn't have to be pre-existing in other words right the, i mean if the, if the town saw a building or saw a place they could purchase it sure and and still use it sure okay i can give you an example again in plainville um they just redid their uh police and fire complex they have a whole new municipal context of that it's, it's beautiful but they currently have the old police and fire department on a main road it's now sitting vacant and underutilized that could be a viable um option for example things like that right. go ahead foxborough same thing yeah the, uh, the old fire station and there was um, um some a portion behind in a, in a home they had taken by tax title mm -hmm. so once we got the new fire station built and I left but the new people planner and, uh -huh. and administration um, uh, have worked to have that whole end of that block rehabbed and there's a, a brew pub opening in the old fire station the uh -huh. front portion and then they've constructed new housing um, all the way in the back back uh -huh. portion of it and, yeah. There's another great example in Sharon. Um, 
really, really beautiful development. It was a school not being utilized anymore. And they added an addition in the back, um, but matched the architectural character of the school and whatnot and kept the landscaping and whatnot. It, it's very beautiful. It looks historic and whatnot, but it's mm -hmm. all new housing. Um, so, so things of that nature kind of can go into this as well. Um, Mr. Chair, if I may, before we close out of this agenda item, yeah. um, I just want to mention that uh, a previous planning board member, Barbara Minkowski, actually sent a list of um, ideas mm -hmm. in relation to the housing production plan based off of what the previous one was. Sure. Yep. I don't know if you've seen that. I have not. But I thought it might be helpful to forward it on to her so she sure. can be aware yeah, of, of that, that as well. Great. And then I know you mentioned the survey results last time you were going to send them off to us. Did we get that yet? I think I sent a link that folks could access to view, but I'm happy to send it again just to ensure. Thank you. Um, I will make sure that gets back out if it did not um, get to you folks. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah, that, that might have been, um, that might have slipped through the cracks. I will definitely get that to you folks. Um, one more thing I would like to request before we move on is could we potentially spend 10 minutes just um, reorganizing these so that they are reflective of how we'd like them to see presented in the like the order in the plan for the um, strategies yes would that be okay yeah um, absolutely um six or seven are in the right order okay. I, I was just thinking that thinking <laughs> i'm zooming out large that's easy okay mm -hmm. six and seven stay so we had five a probably stays no. there but it gets changed to low so five six and yeah. seven five, right six, are and the seven. lows well, okay the only one number one Nora, you had the uh, comment about the percentage of folks in the age bracket. Well, yeah, my, my concern is if we remove this as a high, then we have to deal with the senior residents uh, in a different strategy then. May but I propose it stays high, but it's just not the first one you read. So, for example, maybe the first one is either the outreach or the key zoning um yes given that that sounds good That's i think fine. three and then four and then one yeah and, and maybe move two to the group them in the mediums after the highs right so yeah. right so it'll be okay. right so this will be then two will become four and then um we're feeling one two three yeah yes. okay great thank you folks for doing that um, I will reorder those. That's how they will appear in the plan. Okay. Excellent. Um, just to give kind of context for where we're going from here, we will, we're essentially in the writing portion now. The contract that we have ends in, uh, I believe, end of March, given that that's when your current HPP will expire. Um, so we're going to aim to probably bring a draft sometime end of February, early March. Um, we will first present the text um, for you folks to read, either in a Word doc or a PDF. Then we will go back once we have any edits that you folks may have. We will lay it out into a nice um, graphically designed layout. Um, we have plenty of nice drone photos from Lakeville because we've done a lot of work here, so it will look very good. Um, and then you folks will review it. We'll ensure that everyone is feeling good because then you folks will recommend it to the select board. Um, once everyone is feeling good on it, we bring it up to DHCD, ask them if they have any edits. Um, that can kind of be a slow moving process, so we'll see how long it takes. I can't, I, I'm not sure entirely where it is because I know they've got a lot going on up there. And then that comes back down, we bring it back to everyone and finalize it so you folks can adopt it. And then it's just necessary that you furnish proof to DHCD that it has been adopted. And then you're set for another five years. So. Sounds good. Sounds like a plan. Excellent. Thank you. I appreciate all your input. Um, I will hang around for your, your next agenda item. Okay. Next agenda item is the MBTA Communities Program Discussion. And your name is still on it. Great. <laughs> yeah. So, but I'll, um, I'll, I'll, start it, sure. <laughs> I'll start it off and say how we got here. Yeah. And then, then I'll turn it over to Taylor. So, in early December, I was talking to Taylor probably about this, but then... And, uh, uh, or maybe I called her, but uh, to <laughs> ask, <chatted>. about, <laughs> ask about um, what other resources are available for us to um, try and uh, have uh, somebody or um, an organization 
company uh, do the required elements to comply with the MDTA program. So there's a, before you adopt the, the zoning. Wi-Fi. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Everything was good else. I just need the password. So before you adopt zoning, you have to do these preliminary analysis, let's say, of, um, of housing in the community. And that's what Taylor will explain a little bit more about. Um, so she called me back a week later and said that um, she had, had been talking with Katie Lacey, who's the planner for Mass Housing Partnership, mm -hmm. and said that uh, the Mass Housing Partnership had put out a uh, request for um, communities to uh, for assistance earlier in the fall, mm -hmm. but primarily to the commuter rail communities and the MBTA, the, the higher level communities. Mm -hmm. So um, again, we're low. Yes, we're low. We're uh, <laughs> a, um, adjoining small town, so yeah. uh, an abutting small town. Mm -hmm. So uh, Katie um, had told uh, Taylor that some of the communities dropped out mm -hmm. or couldn't meet their requirements at the time. So there is extra funding available. So mm -hmm. she called me. I talked to Katie. I submitted an application and it was approved pending mm -hmm. the approval of a scope of services mm -hmm. that SERPED is going to submit um, to uh, Mass Housing Partnership. Mm -hmm. We will then work through those efforts toward a zoning bylaw that mm -hmm. would allow us to comply by the end of the fiscal year, which is July 1. Right. For the project timeline. Right? Yeah, okay, for the project timeline. Right, you folks yes. have until 2025. Yeah. Yes, right. Yeah, we, yes. So, um, so that's where we are right now. Mm -hmm. And so that's why Taylor is still staying here. <laughs> Hanging out. <laughs> so she can uh, discuss what those elements are going to be. Sure. So speaking kind of broadly because i don't have anything formal necessarily to present because we're still in the scoping phase mark and i will be meeting with katie lacy from mhp along with my colleague robert cabral as we've been talking about um and potentially their contract coordinator from mhp i'm not sure um i believe she'll be coming i'm not sure yet she hasn't responded but we're meeting next wednesday um to discuss the scope of work from what i understand um this is kind of Mass Housing Partnership's initial round of technical assistance. Um, there's a lot of money floating around to assist communities with compliance so that, again, we're not spending, you know, our own dime trying to kind of get aligned. I think there's um, understanding that communities will need assistance with kind of coming up to this point. So um, we're coordinating with MHP to get Lakeville some funding for that. I cannot give a number as to what the dollar amount will be for the project, but that will again kind of depend on the scope of work. But I think right now in the initial phase, Mark and I are just looking to examine the 40R um, for its potential compliance under section 3A. And that will consist of myself and Rob conducting a zoning review of that 40R, um, plugging it into the GIS compliance model that was released at the end of November by DHCD in partnership with Mass Housing. Um, partnership and RKG Associates and a couple of other consultants. There was a, a large pool who worked on that. So we will do that zoning review, run it through the model, and then essentially the model will tell us um, off the bat whether or not the zoning district is compliant and therefore at that point we'll have an idea if that's the existing 40. Correct. Um, and I think that's kind of where the the stop will be will be determining from there on what to do if it is compliant um i know that i don't even think dhcd hasn't released an application at this point in time for a community to apply for compliance um so we'll kind of have to see at the timeline at the end of june or july which is i think when the contract will probably go to because it's three to four months approximately um where we're at where dhcd is at but we as SERPIC have been in communication with DHCD. We've been in communication with folks from Mass Housing Partnership. We're just doing our best to facilitate as much technical assistance given our capacity. Um, 
Lakeville again reached out, so we're happy to happy to help you folks. Um, and again, it, given that you folks have an existing 40R, it's a great place to start to examine compliance. Um, so at this point, basically, we're going to wait and see. Right. And you will run the numbers, mm -hmm. so to speak, on mm -hmm. the existing 40R mm -hmm. and get back to us in approximately June or July. Correct. And at that point, we'll make a decision if we need to amend something, mm -hmm. if we even want to amend it, mm -hmm. if we agree to it or not, or what. That's right. when re really next action we'll take. Right, exactly. And uh, again, given that you folks are now a small, you know, rural adjacent community, you have until 2025 to comply, so you have an extended timeline. So even if um, for some reason there was an amendment or something that we found that needed to occur, you have a couple of years to kind of figure out when you want to bring that to um, town meeting, et cetera. But yeah, it's, we're in the very preliminary stages again. Um, I mean, you folks thankfully aren't starting from scratch. There are some communities who have no existing like zoning that could even be tested. So we have communities that we're working with where we're starting from the ground up with, with siting. Um, so the fact that again, that that has already been in existence for some time is gonna be helpful. Good, okay. Um, I mean, beyond that, I don't have much else to kind of discuss at this time since we're in such the preliminary stages. I can only direct folks to, again, if you want to learn more about the requirements, um, we have this page on our website that, that, um, that kind of walks through our understanding um, where we're at, some key dates. So again, um, filling out that action plan by the 31st if you haven't already to get your interim compliance. Um, and then our, you know, my email is here. My colleague Robert is here as well. Um, you can reach out and uh, inquire further if you have questions. If you're interested in reading the guidelines, we have a link to that. Um, the community letter that the Commonwealth sent out to each participating MBT community. Um, again, the actual statute and then the form to fill out the action plan. We have some webinars that we have uh, done in the past year. We did one back in October and one in November um, on exploring what housing at different densities looks like. So I can quickly pull these up and walk through. I have no internet now. Um, <laughs> where has it gone? I'm, I'm not sure where it's gone, but we have to, um, to their, their story maps. So essentially you would kind of walk through these and um, we did a lot of drone work over the entirety of the Commonwealth looking at what different housing densities could be that could be compliant. Um, so this is kind of more for the community again who might not have a, four, a, you know, a 40R or any sort of zoning district that is even at 15 units per acre which is set by the statute. Um, and then again for those who are starting from scratch and are looking to cite their, um, their new zoning district, we have some information on that as well. And then also DHD to give a presentation to um, MBTA member communities from Serpent's region. Um, Mark, I, I think you were there for that. Um, if you'd like to view the slides and you have internet, unlike myself, um, you can click on that. <laughs> um, and then again, just kind of an overview of all of the folks who are gonna be looking at this in the region. So you folks are living here right now. We are still learning about South Coast Rail. So um, I cannot really answer any questions on that, but thankfully we're not affected because you're already in it. <laughs> um, and just some kind of information about the draft guidelines to the final guidelines, what changed and whatnot. So if you folks have kind of been following along up to this point, this is where you can learn more about that. Um, but this is our kind of hub right now for all of this. When I send out the survey link that kind of gives all the details of that, I will make sure that this link goes out as well. Um, and then beyond that, the only other thing I can recommend is if you have very specific questions, I would reach out to the team who's working on this at DHGD because they, they have the attorneys who can answer the questions. <laughs> um, a lot of this is, is um, you know, has to kind of go through that, that legal process to determine what is the legal, um, you know, pathway. Okay. So yeah, I will send all those resources out. I will keep you folks posted um, as this develops. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Taylor. We appreciate you coming in tonight. Too. Thank you for having Thank me. You. My email will be on that as well. So feel free to reach out if you have any additional questions. Um, otherwise, have a good night, folks. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, we have a set of minutes for November 10th. 2022 to review and approve. Has everybody had a chance to look at those? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. I spent Kathy my two reviews and I think they look good now. <laughs>
you have made a few edits I'm already with Kathy, yeah, and this is the clean copy? Yes, it is. So I'll make a motion to approve the minutes for the planning board meeting on Thursday, November 10th, 2022. Second. As drafted. Have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Minutes are approved. Um, make the announcement that our next meeting is January 26th, 2023. It will be here at the Lakeport Police Station in the meeting room at 7 p.m. Uh, Mark, do we have any correspondence we want to go over? Um, the correspondence from the other cities and towns were relatively minor, mostly small subdivisions, no more huge warehouses. Um, <laughs> however, we did receive a MEPA notice that uh, another warehouse is proposed. Um, MEPA is kind of their first step in filing for these large projects. Um, at 27 Harding Street in Middleborough, which is um, yeah, just uh, past Irving's. Uh, there's a hotel just past there on the right, yep. same side. Kind is of that the old drive-in? I don't know what, what was back there. Yeah, I think it is. And is that is that in like the Pocoy Brook area? Yes. Okay, that's actually yes, right across the street from where my son's father lives. It's a shame actually because there's a lot of wetlands and I uh, know there's protected species there. So there's a... Um, so hence the MEPA. Cold water trout brook. <laughs> well, we know FedEx, yeah, right? Brook FedEx Hawaii. pulled out of the old mm -hmm. Galleria. Oh yeah? You know, they're not putting a warehouse in. They're backing off of their warehouse plans as is Amazon. Oh really? For the hospital? For the uh, Taunton the mall? mall? Yeah. FedEx backed out. Hmm. Huh. And what happened? It had... I remember when Barbara was on CERP and she said that they were talking about trash hauling out of there via rail. Yeah, no? no. So, so they're doing their um, NEPA visit, in-person visit on the 19th of January, bundle up, um, or a, I guess maybe there isn't a Zoom meeting. Uh, Excuse me. But MEPA Sorry. comments are due January 21st, 2023. So um, you can look that up um, on the MEPA. They have a public comment portal as well. So, and speaking of warehouses, so this is something I used to do with all my other planning boards, but I forgot that I used to do it is I used to every meeting or two hand out a little reading of from some planning magazine or training thing or something so this one um so I'd been compiling a big folder of these and um I finally looked through them and go oh this one I ought to pull right out because it has to do with warehouses and so it's really it's really a, more of a discussion of kind of where the um the trend on warehouses is going um, and why uh, these um, are being, um, uh, you know, um, proposed and a little bit into kind of the pluses and minuses and what to be um, to consider when one is being proposed in the town. But it's it's not it doesn't take any any uh, position being from the planning magazine very neutral very neutral but it kind of lays out well this is why these things are being proposed and so thank you that thought it'd be we saw a, a big brand new vacant warehouse uh <laughs> oh 123 in norton yeah uh, i had just gone by there i hadn't been over there in years there's a nice uh, housing development. There used to be a driving range. You'd see from Route 495, uh, right as you approached 123, and now it's a warehouse. And it's got to be like in the past year it was built. Mm -hmm. But there's only one tenant mm -hmm. out of all the spaces, which is. I don't know. That's um, the trend you do. Do you know who I it mean, is? FedEx and Amazon have both come out and said they're going to be downsizing their warehousing. Yeah. Because well, the economy is not 
they are to support right now. Well, I know, I know that. Bridgewater too, that gigantic, not far from the road on Route 18. Yeah. Yeah. So I know, I know that Amazon is 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 kind of consolidating a little bit, but that's because they went through such an explosive growth, particularly during the pandemic. So now they're catching their breath. They're leveling off. They're going, okay, we open lease this one we built that one and they're reevaluating and um reassessing however all these other companies you know and fedex may may be in the same boat but all these other companies that have e-commerce websites that are growing you know have the need for these yes, last mile warehouses no. that's and, correct and we certainly saw that massive influx well and where you're going to see another growth and this is Coming off of my most recent history is in the food distribution. Fuel They're distribution? Food distribution. Food distribution. They're building where million square foot warehouses like crazy right now. Because they're trying to get warehousing closer to their customers. So instead of driving 150 miles, they only want to drive 50 miles. And they're putting in 40, 50, 60,000 items in these warehouses. And it's not cold storage, it's dry. Yeah. yeah. It does sound like we have quite a bit of growth, warehouse, housing. You know, I, you look at Route 44, here we have Middleborough. We've got the housing um, coming off of Church Street in 44 and Raynham. We've got the housing coming in the Middleborough. We've got a re- commuter rail community now, Freetown. So now they're open to 43B. Yeah. So we're really going to be surrounded. And, and when I think of in- infrastructure, um, I think we're overloaded as it is. And when we talk about what we need in town, I think of a grocery store is not just something we would like to see, it's now we're gonna need to see because it's gonna not just take 10, 15 minutes to get to the closest grocery store, it's gonna take 30, 40 minutes sitting in traffic just to get to one. So I think we really need to do some, some, um, you know, some work planning wise and maybe maybe see what we can do to entice certain things that we, we know we need in Keep town. Keep it in town instead yeah. of leave town. Instead of leaving town because the traffic is going to be ridiculous. And you know, state roads, we're low down on the priority. So they're not going to you know, widen or make these roads bigger because we're low priority. We can't rely on right. the state to take care of those roads. They still are the folks that want to keep it rural. Yep, exactly. So that's going to be a continuing battle. Yeah. All right, uh, I'm going to make a motion to adjourn. So second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Meeting is adjourned.